John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. Don't forget that. That's important. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we, like, listen, dude, we know that you are a teacher that comes from God. For no one can do these things. No one can do these signs. No one can do these wonders unless God is with him. Now I want you to notice how Jesus doesn't even acknowledge it. Jesus doesn't even acknowledge the flattery. He doesn't even say, thank you, my dude. <laughs> I appreciate that. You recognize I'm a rabbi. I appreciate that. Look at what Jesus says. Jesus says, verse 3 out of nowhere, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. <laughs> Y'all seen this? Hey, Jesus, there's something about you, bro. You're a little different. I mean, like, I haven't seen anybody like you, and, and you got to be from God, my dude. The, the rest of the Pharisees, they low-key tripping. But when I see you, when I hear you preach, you must be from God. That's great. You must be born again. You must be born again. If you're not, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how? How can a man be born when he is old, surely he can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Jesus answered, surely I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. I think right now Nicodemus had his mouth open. The reason I think he had his mouth open, look at verse 7. Jesus says, do not marvel, <laughs> do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Look, bro, the wind blows wherever it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus is scratching his head, and he says, how can these things be? And this is like the original roaster. Like Jesus roasts this dude. Look what Jesus says in verse 10. He says, are you the teacher of Israel? <laughs> like you getting up in the synagogue and you preaching every Sunday though. Like, like you have read the scrolls your whole life. You are up here preaching and you don't know these things? What has happened to the church when we have preachers who aren't born again so they don't teach it? Ooh, Lord. Now look, look, let's do a little hopscotch. John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verse 39. If you dare shout, I got it. Y'all didn't shout it, so I'm going to say it again. John chapter 19, verse 39. If you don't have it, you can look at the screen. Would you shout, I got it? It says, Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night. Please don't miss this. Don't miss it. I'm trying to calm down. Calm down, preach. All right. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with spices as the custom of the Jews is to be buried. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, and everybody under the sound of my voice who has graced me with your presence on this afternoon and who is watching online, a verse of importance and the verse that I would like you to pay attention to the verses that I believe are going to serve as a flight attendant so we can reach a cruising altitude of life change and life impact throughout this sermonic journey. I want you to notice how in John chapter 3, verse 2, we see the text tells us Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Can I get somebody to say at night? At night. Okay. Now, in John Chapter 19, verse 39, we see Nicodemus out in public, boldly 
at the cross where Jesus just died on. And the text says Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus at night. This brother now is bringing over 100 pounds of myrrh and olives. Okay, what happened? This is how I'm studying. Y'all just hearing like stuff that I was thinking in my mind. What happened inside of Nicodemus to where in John chapter 3, he's creeping to see Jesus at night. I like to call Nicodemus Nick at night. <laughs> Anybody grew up watching Nick at Night? Like one of my shows was This Is All That. This is, okay. Y'all remember, see? Yeah, right? Nick at Night. We're going to do that for uh, this sermon. Nick at Night. What happened on the inside of Nick at Night? To where in John chapter 3, we see him sneaking to see Jesus. I don't want nobody to know we talk, I don't want nobody to think we're together. I don't want nobody to think I'm a follower of you. Here it is. I don't want nobody to call me a church girl or a church boy. I don't want nobody to label me as a Jesus freak. I don't want nobody to label me as a holy roller. I don't want nobody to identify me with Jesus. How do we go from, in John chapter 3, Nicodemus giving us side piece vibes? <laughs> this is going to be so good, y'all. How do we go from you giving like... Side peace vibes in John chapter 3. But then in John chapter 19, you are out in the open at the cross of Jesus. You got to a place, Nicodemus, where you don't care if people think that you're with Jesus. You don't care if people think that you're a follower of Jesus. You don't care if people think that you're a disciple of Jesus. Here it is. You don't care if my faith offends you. You don't care if my radical stance offends you. You don't care if my praise offends you. You don't care if my worship offends you because I'm not worshiping you anyway. You don't care if my biblical standards... You don't care if my biblical standards along with my purity upsets you. You don't even care if my unwillingness to compromise just so that I can get a like from a person that doesn't even like themselves. Did y'all hear what I just said? I need my towel so I can't throw it yet. I need it. How do you get to a place to where I'm not compromising just so I can get a like from people who don't even like themselves. Because here it is, this is for somebody, this is for somebody, their rejection of you is not a receipt of your value. Talk Holy Ghost. Let's go a little deeper. Their discernment issue is not a mirror of your worth. It's not my fault that you can't discern that I'm called. It's not my fault that you can't discern that I'm anointed. It's not my fault that you can't discern the oil on my life. It's not my fault that you can't discern the grace of God on my life. It's not my fault that you can't discern what God is calling me to do. Your discernment issue, my brother or my sister, is not a mirror of my worth. Can I get somebody to say, return to sender? Now, you got to say it like you got an epiphany of who you are in Christ. You got to say it like you understand. Even if they rejected you, God accepted you before they ever rejected you. Can I get you with your hands? Say, return to sender. Return to sender. <laughs> How does Nicodemus go from John chapter 3, giving us side piece vibes, to John chapter 19, not caring what people think about him? What happened between 3 and 19? What happened between those 16 chapters? Nicodemus had a king encounter. So good, y'all. Nicodemus had a king encounter. See, listen, when you fully understand what Jesus did for you on the cross, like when you get the epiphany and biblical intelligence where you understand what Jesus did on the cross. He didn't just die for you. He died as you. Like, I want us to get this. When you fully begin to understand that only God is the author and finisher of your faith, you'll stop treating readers like authors. Woo. 
You'll stop treating readers like authors. Those people on your job, they're just reading your story. All those people who follow you on social media, they're just reading your story. Your mama and them, they're just reading your story. Your ex, all they could do is read your story. They can't even make edits, y'all. The only person who has the authority to make edits is the author, and they are not my author. This is so good, y'all. When you fully understand what Jesus did on the cross. See, listen, y'all, I believe Jesus couldn't stand the thought of a sin-stricken people walking around this earth without ever knowing and without ever experiencing the most holistic, powerful, soul-quenching relationship known to man. And that is not knowing God as creator to create it. Jesus wants us to know God as Abba. Listen, hear me. Abba in Aramaic is father. So anytime you're reading the scriptures and you see the text say, Abba, father, that literally means the fatherhood of God. Okay? It means now we can experience God's care as his children. Did y'all catch what I just said? All right, let me drive it home where it hits you a little harder. Some of us have been getting God's care as people who are in rebellion. Could you imagine the amount of care you get when you now become God's children? Okay? Now I'm going to mess somebody's theology up. This is going to get some letters sent to the church. There are a lot of people who say, we're all, too, we're all the children of God. All of us. Doesn't matter what you believe. We are all the children of God. That sounds good. That's quotable, but it's not biblical. Ooh, let me come for your theology. Let me come for your theology. We're all children of God. No, we are all created by God. And we all are under the authority of God. But how you become children of God is what Jesus is trying to get Nicodemus to understand. The only way that you can become children of God is you must be born again. Now, see, the clap's going down, so let me give you Bible. Let me give you Bible, because I want y'all to see I'm not up here preaching perspective. Jared doesn't preach his opinion. We preach doctrine. Let me show y'all two scriptures real quick. Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. It says, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and are in earth. Now, look, John chapter 1, verse 12, it says... But as many as received him, speaking of Jesus, to him, he gave the right to become, what does your Bible say? Children of God to those who believe in him. We're all children of God. That's quotable, sis. That's quotable, bro, but it's not biblical. We become children of God once we are born again. Now, I want to provide us with a little biblical depth, and let's do a surgical operation on this biblical candidate that we're talking about this afternoon, Nicodemus. Somebody said Nicodemus, and I said Nick at night. Y'all never going to hear him again. Say Nicodemus, Nick at night. Now, Nicodemus is a Pharisee. He is a teacher of the law. And he is a part of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is a Jewish judicial court. So his whole life, Nicodemus has been studying the law of Moses. He knows the Torah. The Torah are the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those men who grew up to be Pharisees would know the whole book of the law by seven. Some of us, all we know is John 3, 16 and Psalm 23. We're talking seven-year-olds that can quote Genesis to Deuteronomy, all of it. He knows the law. He has studied the law. And his whole lifestyle is dedicated to living his life by a list of do's and don'ts. He is religious at best. And he teaches other people, this is how you should live. And he believes this because this is the only way that you could truly inherit the kingdom of God. Listen, y'all, Nicodemus is one of the best, one of the coldest 
with the scriptures, studying them every day, all day, could tell you what this scroll meant. See, some of we're spoiled. Like if I say turn to Isaiah, you just go to your U version, click Isaiah. Back then they had scrolls. So it's like, go to Isaiah. And just this thing roll. Okay, let me go to Isaiah. That was all of it. But there's something that's happening on the inside of Nicodemus when he's hearing Jesus preach. I could just imagine Nicodemus is in the temple. And all of his partners can't stand Jesus. They think Jesus is a scam artist. But there's like this fire that is burning on the inside of Nicodemus and he can't explain it. He can't articulate it. I know that everybody thinks that this Jesus is false. They even said that nothing good could come from Nazareth. Did y'all know Jesus came from the hood? <laughs> the south side of Nazareth. Like the south side, south side. Yeah, like Jesus came. <laughs> I'm saying read your Bible. Nazareth is a small, filth-ridden town. Now, how could a big God come from a small place? I don't have time to bother that. I don't have time to bother that. He's, he's feeling something as he's hearing Jesus preach. The same way you be feeling it when you're in the sanctuary and you hear a message and it's your face getting hot and, and you feel this burning on the inside of you, watching online sermon after sermon, there's something on the inside of you that starts to get on fire. You can't even look at your boyfriend the same. You can't even look at your sin the same. It's something happening. It's not Jerry who's doing this. It's the Spirit of God tugging at your heart saying, I have more for you. And I believe Nicodemus is like, man... There's something about this dude. Like, I can't recall any time when any of the Pharisees got up, read a scroll, and a demon hollered out, leave us alone. <laughs> Why don't they do that when I read it? How have we been having church for all these years and people are coming crooked, but then when Jesus comes, they're leaving straight? He's doing it on the Sabbath, and I know all my boys have a problem with it, but for me, there's, there's, there's something about this Jesus. There's, there's something about this man who claims to be the Son of God, that there's something about this man who claims to be the bread of heaven. There's something about this man who keeps saying, if you tear this temple down, I can rebuild it in three days, and Nicodemus is flabbergasted, and he's like, how are you going to rebuild this temple in three days? It took 40 years to do this, not understanding that Jesus was talking about his body. Yeah, y'all could murk me, y'all could ride on me, but in three days, I'm getting right back up again. So good, y'all. I want you to get this. So now, due to what Nicodemus is feeling, he's like, I got to go to Jesus because I got some questions. But I can't let my clique know. Here it is. I can't let the people who I'm with know that I'm going to go see Jesus. Because you understand, I'm a teacher of the law. So I'm going to have to figure out a way I can see Jesus undercover. So good, y'all. Listen, I have to figure out a way. I could be a person who's being taught by Jesus, but nobody knows it. Because in that day, Jesus was one of the most controversial people who walked the face of the earth. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees are like, this man is disrupting what we stand for. He's rattling the container of our religious perspectives and beliefs. This is not a prophet. Something is wrong with him. He's a heretic. But, but. Nicodemus couldn't shake the feeling that I think there's more to this Jesus. I don't think that miracles just stopped in the Old Testament. I, I do believe that God truly wants us to be set free. I, I do believe that God is calling for some of us, and he doesn't want his clique to know. Can I tell y'all something? I believe they were having a great problem with it because Jesus was taking the attention off of them. Look, y'all, this is why last week... I said, the, center of the, rule of, the rule of the synagogue stood up and said, y'all come on other days to get healed. They had a problem with it. And as I was studying this, I felt that God put this on my spirit. If Jesus were to come down and preach in our churches today, 90% of them, the pastors, would be upset. Mm-hmm. 
The pastors, the bishops, the the apostles, whatever you want to call them, evangelists, whatever you want to call them, I believe they would be upset. You know why? Because Jesus would expose that you only in ministry as a bandage to your ego. Not because you really care about souls. You care more about your following. You care more about your following and your platform, which is why we have pastors who want to be celebrities. And I would expose that you have been making it all about you, which is why you have members who don't read their Bibles. They just read your post. I'm trying to show you that if Jesus were to teach in a lot of our churches, we would have a problem with it. (laughs) We would have a problem with it because it takes all the attention off a man and puts all of it on Jesus. So the chief priest were like, he's taking all the attention off of us. And he's speaking in such a way that they're coming to him and looking to God without looking to us. Whenever I use the pulpit to try to grow my fan base, this is no longer a church. It's a cult. Woo, Lord. That's not even my notes. It's just the Holy Spirit talking right now. And so he's like, I, I, I got to go to Jesus. I got to go to Jesus in a way where nobody would know. This pandemic that we are in, church family, has exposed a lot of people don't have a rhema word. What do you do now when your contract said, I will only speak if there are a thousand people, and all you could do now is speak to a camera? It will reveal you weren't saying anything in the first place. Thank you for the one clap. (laughs) So he says, I'm going to go and I'm going to start treating Jesus like a side piece. Nobody's going to know about this. Make sure there's nobody out in the street. I believe Nicodemus was on his TLC, so I'm a creep. He's creeping (laughs) on the down low to see Jesus, and he's treating Jesus like a side piece savior. Now, don't judge him because some of us do it too. Mm -hmm. We in the sanctuary on this afternoon, and we are watching online treating Jesus like a side piece. Now, you do know there are rules to be a side piece, right? Oh, y'all ready for this? And y'all, no, y'all not. Y'all ready for this? Y'all might as well just say, no, I'm not. Got Got your pen and paper. There are rules to being a side piece. Rule number one, you always number two. (laughs) This is about to be good, y'all. Rule number one, you always number two. Jesus, you might even be number three, number four, number five. It just depends on if I need you today. It just depends on if I get COVID, then we'll talk. It all depends on if I get laid off, then we'll talk. It all depends on if I face a crisis, then we'll talk. Number one, you always number two. You always number two. This is why I believe now, why the gospels tell us, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. I told us this in the Try Me series. Have you noticed when you go to restaurants, you get bread first and you get water first? And if you're like me, you ate so much bread and drink so much water that by the time they bring you your meal, you're so full with what you just ate. What if Jesus really is the bread of heaven? Connection. What if Jesus really is the living water? Connection. And if I consume him first, by the time the world offers me its temptations, I don't even want it. <laughs> I don't even want it because I had so much Jesus. You text me, hey, what's up? But I had Jesus this morning. You text me you want to come through, but I had Jesus this morning. You text me you want to come by, but I have Jesus this morning. Maybe the beauty of eating Jesus first is you'll be so full of him that you don't even want what they offer. Side piece rules. Rule number one, you always rule number two. You always number two. Rule number two of being a side piece, you can't contact me freely. This is like roundhouse kicking somebody in the neck bone. I feel you. You you can't contact me freely. Don't hit me in the middle of the night, interrupt my sleep, and try to have me pray. Uh Uh-uh. I'm tired. I'm tired. Like, you only get Jesus. You only get 
my leftover strength. Like prayer for me is a last resort. It's not a first response. When somebody's correcting me, don't, don't speak to me, Holy Spirit, and tell me to be quiet and receive it because it's going to help me grow. You do not have the right to talk to me when you want to. It's getting real in here. Side piece. Side piece. It, it's what the, the author Dallas Willard calls vampire Christianity. I just want Jesus' blood, and that's it. Save me. Don't change me. <laughs> <laughs> side piece savior you can't contact me freely I hit you when I need you you on my terms I'm not on yours y'all should see y'all faces I'm just being obedient y'all somebody say rule number two you can't contact me freely some of y'all didn't want to say it because I know it hurts All right. rule number three no one knows we spend time together Side piece, can't nobody know about us. Nobody knows I'm a Christian. Nobody can know what I stand for. Nobody can know what I believe. Nobody could know my commitment. My coworkers can't tell that I'm with you, Jesus. My boyfriend that I live with, oops, he can't tell that I'm with you, Jesus. Matter of fact, you know when you cold, I hope nobody does this because what I'm about to say is really cold. But when you cold, it's like you give your side piece, like for Christmas, you gave your side piece and your main piece the same perfume. So that your main piece can't ever tell you smell like another woman. <laughs> like, you know, when you're really trying to sneak, you got to be innovative. Like you start saving the contact as Pizza Hut. No, Pizza Hut don't call you that much. <laughs> You changing the contact to the gym. You don't work out that hard, bruh. Like when you are treating somebody as a side chick, you got to be creative. You got to be innovative. You got to be sneaky. So nobody will know it. Nobody. I don't want nobody. She can't tell that I smell like her because y'all smell the same. I stay away from people who hold me accountable. Like why when you hook up with them, you stop talking to me and Tanisha? We're not God. Or is it you fear that your spiritual leaders could smell another fragrance? All right. All right. I do believe you need leaders who have discernment. Like you smell like you've been with another idol. You, you smell like you've been with compromise. But maybe I try to stay away because I'm trying to operate like Jesus is my side piece. Rule number four, you're a side piece, so no main piece feelings are allowed. Like, you are a side piece. That's all you are, Jesus. You're not a main piece. So don't get jealous over my other idols. Don't bother me when I binge Netflix, but I can't follow us. Don't bother me when I can binge all Game of Thrones. I can binge all the power, but I don't have no power. I can binge all of this, but I can't stick to a Bible reading plan. You don't have the right to get main piece feelings. You a side piece. You know that you're second. You know that you're second. Or oh, what about rule number five? Don't expect this to go anywhere. When you're a side piece, you can't ask, so what are we? <laughs> so where do you see this relationship going? So, so where, where do you see us in five years? You're going to mess up the fun if you do that. Don't try to define this. Don't try to give a label to it. Just appreciate the limited amount of time I give you. But don't expect more than that. You will ruin the side piece relationship if you actually expect commitment, if you actually expect devotion, if you actually expect obedience, if you actually expect fasting. You'll ruin it. Don't ask for that. Ooh, your scalp. Ooh. Okay. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night in John chapter 3. But then he was at the cross in public in John chapter 19. What happened between 3 and 19, he had a king encounter. And this is the question. This is the quintessential question that I want you to ask yourselves on this afternoon. Am I more like Nicodemus in John chapter 3, treating Jesus like a side piece? Or, more, or am I more like Nicodemus 
in John chapter 19. I'm going public with this. I'm not hiding it. Everybody's going to know what I stand for. You are never going to mistake whose side I'm on. You're never going to mistake what I believe. I may not be perfect, oh, but you're going to know who my Savior is. Which one do you identify with more? I said all of that to say, I want to speak around this thought from this subject for just a few more moments on this beautiful cold winter afternoon side piece. Side piece. God, would you help us? The conviction we feel, God, help us to embrace it. Help us to cherish it. I know this is an awkward prayer, but God, thank you for conviction. Thank you for correction so that we can get right. And Father, if we identify more with John 3 than John 19, we ask, will you perform surgery in John 4 and John 5 and John 6 all the way to John 19 so in our lifestyle we'll live a life where I am unashamed of the gospel. And I don't care what people think about me. If I lose them, but I find you, it's worth it. If I have to let that go, but in you I grow, it's worth it. If it hurts me, but it heals me, because sometimes the hardest thing and the healthiest thing are one and the same. God, give us health and give us hearts that will no longer treat you like a side piece. Because you're worth our honesty and you're worth public profession. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody agrees that prayer, would just shout amen. amen. Woo! Can y'all believe that? That was intro, y'all. Look, let me get us to say this confession. And everybody online, put this in the room in all caps. Everybody in the house, can I get us to say, Father, Father give, me the boldness give me the boldness to live out my encounter. Out my encounter. You're, too good You're too good for me to hide you. One more time, Father, give me the boldness to live out my encounter. You are too good for me to hide you. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, what I'm attempting to articulate to you might come as a shock to some, education to some, but then just a reminder to others. And that is, whenever you have made up your mind to follow Jesus for real, like for real, whenever you have made your mind up to really follow Jesus, like you have drawn a line in the sand of demarcation, this is what I'm going to live by, whenever you made your mind up to follow Jesus, it always comes with the breakup. Did y'all hear me? Whenever you have made up your mind, I'm going to live for Jesus. You're not going to be perfect like I told us last week. You're not going to be sinless, but you will sin less. Whenever you made your mind up to follow Jesus, it always comes with the breakup. When your relationship with God changes, by default, your relationship with sin changes. When your relationship with your Bible changes, by default, your relationship with rebellion changes. Either the Bible is keeping you from sin or sin is keeping you from the Bible. One affects the other. The shadow of a king encounter is when there has been a breakup in my life. Everything will start to change. What you like changes. What you watch changes. Like certain things I can't watch anymore. Like I was a slave to porn in college. Certain TV shows I can't watch because it takes my mind back. That's not churchy. That's knowing my, my flesh. Everything changes. What you label as success changes. Your dreams changes. What you call your type changes. What you think is cute and fine changes. You're like, yeah, girl, uh, you fine, but does God have your heart? See how we got one clap? <laughs> you fine, but does God have your heart? Because if God doesn't have your heart, I can't trust you'll never have my back. Yeah, yeah, you, you fine, bro, and you in church, and you six feet, and you got a beard, that's great. Um, but does God have your mind, though? 
Because the Bible I read says you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. And as a man thinketh, so is he. What I'm going to have to deal with is not how fine you are, not your beard. I'm going to have to deal with, sir, how you think. Like your, your, your life is constructed by how you think. And your life moves in the direction of your most dominant thought. If you're going to be my head, I need to spend time enough to see how you think. Because if you only see the way this man thinks in spring, the season of growth, it might scare you how he thinks in winter. The season of loss. How do you think? <laughs> Everything changes. What we're silent on changes. We can't be a fearful church and expect to lead a fearless generation. Everything changes. I'm trying to get us to understand. And I'm preaching so passionately to you because I want you to understand life change terrifies hell. Not just your words, well, I'm about to, well, I'm going, well, you know, I'm going to do this. Well, you know, 2022, I made my mind up. I wrote it down. It's on my mirror every time I went, like, I'm going to do this. Your words mean nothing. Open, when you start doing it, when you start praying outside of us telling you to pray, when you start seeking God on your own, life change terrifies hell. And you cannot have a king encounter and not change. Everything changes. Everything changes. Everything changes. Everything changes. Everything changes. Everything changes. You have had an organic encounter with the king. Everything changes. Everything changes. I can't get high like I used to because I met the king. Everything changes. There are certain places I can't go because everything changes. Everything changes. Listen, y'all. Closer comes with further. The closer I get to purpose, the further I get from meaningless. The, the further I get from distractions, the closer I get to focus. I cannot meet the king of glory and remain the same. It's impossible. So how do we have all of these people who are saying, I have met him, but there has been no breakup? Break up with racism? Break up with injustice? Break up with your will? Break up with spiritual laziness? Like you don't need a miracle, you need mechanics. I need to make some alterations to my lifestyle. It's going to be followed by a breakup. Because if you didn't notice, I'm trying to help you understand, Jesus is not cool with you staying in contact with your ex. I'm trying, sis. I'm trying. I'm not cool with you staying in contact with your ex-idols. Stop going back to what you asked me to save you from. Don't romanticize the memory, but forget the hangover. I'm not cool with being a side piece. I want to be your everything. I want to be your totality. I don't want you to just come to me when you're going through something. I want you to come to me even when your life is blessed. Even when you have more than what you prayed for, I want you to seek my face. When you feel like you have no problems, I want you to worship me. When you feel like everything is great, I want you to worship me. For some of us, the reason I can't give you success is because you'll lose your sense. You'll forget about the God who wiped your tears all the times you were crying and saying, if you help me this time, God, I'm never going to go back. I don't want you to stay in contact with your ex. I just believe God is that good where he deserves our all. Yeah. Preach Holy Spirit. And a lot of us, you can't hear God's forward instruction because you are stuck in former reflection. I believe Nicodemus started to wonder to himself, there's something about him. There's something different about him. Like he's giving hope to the hopeless, but then he's turning around and eating with tax collectors and sinners. And I, and I hear my click because if he was really from God, he wouldn't eat with tax collectors and sinners because God don't fool with those type of people. 
Or is it truly Jesus is the God man? Which means he's man enough to step in your situation. But then he's God enough at the same time to bring you out. Something about this Jesus. I've been looking at Isaiah and I've been looking at the prophets and I've been studying the scrolls. But I haven't felt a fire like this. Like I'm feeling when I hear, hear this Jesus. Like his words stick to me. Y'all ever came to church and heard a word that just stuck to you? Like you remember the quote. You, okay, I'm not sinless. Oh, but I sin less. Like you remember it. It was sticking to him. Jesus is starting to bother my Old Testament theology. Nicodemus was in love where, where God used to be. Hear me. Anybody who is religious loves where God used to live. Something about this Jesus, and I can't shake it. You know why? Because once you accept the Prince of Peace, he affects every piece of your life. Every piece. Let me give you a Bible. We usually read this around Christmas, but look. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says, for, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But then if we look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, it says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. What? Um, okay. Jesus... You made a mistake, okay? I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Hold on, Jesus. Hold up. But you said, blessed are the peacemakers. You said to the best of your capability, live at peace with all men. All of us, right? I just need peace. I value peace. I protect my peace. I, I need peace. And Jesus is saying, I didn't come to bring peace on earth. He's saying, listen, I came to bring peace on the inside of you and peace between man and God. Because before my death on the cross, we are all subjects of wrath. But through me dying on the cross... Now, man can have peace with God. God, I hope y'all are getting this, y'all. This is the beauty of the gospel. I now can have peace with God through what the Prince of Peace did on the cross. So in this world, you will have trouble. He told us that. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And I'm going to give you peace that surpasses your understanding. So even when everything around you is in chaos, peace is still in you. I'm going to give you peace. But you got to understand, everybody's not going to like that you are following the Prince of Peace. And so your mama may not like it. Your daddy may not like it. Your boyfriend that's about to be your ex may not like it. Your girlfriend that may not, I feel like I'm speaking prophetically. Your girlfriend that's about to be your ex may not like it. But the Prince of Peace loves it. And so will your soul love it. Because the Prince of Peace affects every piece of your life. Look, can I, can I get y'all, come, come here real quick, um, the choir. Can I, can I get y'all clapping up for the choir? Y'all can do better than that each and every week. <laughs> All right. So, Tanisha, you come up front. You my bride. You can just stand right here. Amber, you can just stand right here. Tiffany, you can stand in front of Amber. Y'all face me. Face me. So stand like, come here. like a line. Yeah, come here. Oh. You just stand right here. And Tiffany, you stand right here. And then beautiful lady, you stand right here. All y'all beautiful, but y'all know it's my wife being biased. Okay. <laughs> so this is what happens. These are pieces of Tanisha's life. Her desire, what she wants, her preference. Okay? But Tanisha has made the decision that she's going to follow the Prince of Peace. Now, every piece of her is connected. So just put this hand back and you just grab her wrist. All right? And you do the same thing. Put your hand back, grab her wrist. Put your hand back and grab her wrist. All right. With Tanisha, she is connected to what she wants, her desires, and her preferences. 
But she said, I want the prince of peace now to be my Lord. So now you hold me. So I want him to now lead my life. I want him to guide my life. And a lot of us view our relationship with the Lord like this. But it's really like this. Y'all missed it. Do it again. A lot of us, if I pray enough, if I fast enough, if I seek his face enough, this is how we think our relationship is. And God's like, nothing could pluck you out of my hand. I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. I'm right here with you the whole time. But here's the problem, though. When you're following the Prince of Peace and he leads you, every other piece is coming with you. Okay? Y'all scoot on back because we're going to drag a lot. Y'all scoot on back. I ain't going to drag you too much because I don't want you to fall and end up on church and laugh. <laughs> so now look. Look, y'all. Now I'm holding you. Okay? You never let me down. You never were holding me up. I'm holding you. So as she's following me, there's some places that I want to take her. But I want you to notice that the Prince of Peace is affecting every other piece. Now, Tiffany, I want you to resist what we're trying to do, because you her desires, all right? You don't desire to fast, okay? So now I'm trying to lead her, and now she's torn. Ooh, Lord. Has anybody ever feel like you're torn between your will and torn between God's will and torn between what you want and torn between what God wants and torn between getting high and torn between putting it down and torn between passing the cavassier and torn between drinking some water like you're torn. You feel like, okay, I'm going back and forth in this season. And so look, Jesus is not going to do this for you. He's not going to do it for you. Connect again. This is where I'm trying to take you. So what you're going to have to do is make the decision to allow my desires to become your desires. Because the Prince of Peace, God, I hope y'all getting this. The Prince of Peace is going to affect every piece. Now, what I don't want us to do, let me go and go to her. What I don't want us to do is let go of what God wants because of what you want. And guess what you start saying now? I just don't have any peace. In this season of my life, where is all of my peace? I'm working, I'm grinding, I'm going to church, but I still at night when I'm trying to sleep, I have no peace. So I'm trying to find different substances to give me peace. I'm trying to find sex partner after sex partner to give me peace. I'm trying to drink it away and, and club it away. And some of us, it's not sin, but you're trying to work it away. You're just working and working and working and working. You don't have to work that hard, but you're trying to escape the reality that I have no peace. And it's because you chose a peace over his peace. So, it's like, I want to take you back. So I never let you go. Now you make the decision to let that go. Let go. She lets go of it. Now the rest of y'all, just because you let go of your desires, that don't mean that you're perfect. Y'all come up here and grab her. Yeah. <laughs> just, you got dumped. <laughs> Remember, the shadow of a king encounter is a breakup. So you're like, okay, I broke up with my desires. All right, I'm with you, Jesus. He says, okay, what about your preferences, though? What about what you prefer? Mm -hmm. What about the way you want me to be God over your life? Because some of us try to customize how we want God to be God. <laughs> like you ever thought, since I don't like him, God don't like him either? <laughs> customized version of Jesus. Like we have a Jesus menu. This is the Jesus I like. I like it with cucumbers. I like it with this. I don't like all that conviction. The, the customize. <laughs> so he's like, hold on. You, you thought I wanted some of you? I want all of you. So you're going to have to confront everything that's holding you back. Let it go. And you trying to grab on. Grab on. Try to grab on to Tanisha. And you know what I believe? I believe when the Lord sees that you're serious, 
he starts to, y'all back up. Y'all back up. I got this. I got her mind. I got her peace. I got her comfort. I got her joy. I got her confidence. I got her esteem. I got her glory. I got her. She's in me. Y'all can't touch her. She's mine. Y'all can't mess with her. She's mine. Y'all can't do anything. All the weapons y'all form me won't prosper because she's mine. All this stuff that you're trying to do, you can't do it because she's mine. You can't take her back. You can't have her. Hell lost one. She's mine. Y'all go back. She's mine. So look, now, this is why you never have to try to fight for yourself. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. And I promise you, there anybody walking this face of this earth, their arms are too short for God's hands. This is so powerful, y'all. Let me give you these three points, and I'm done. Because Nicodemus was in a place where he had to unlearn. He had to unlearn. Everything that I thought about God, I have to unlearn it. Please hear me. This is for somebody. Your healing is married to your unlearning. Okay? Your healing is married to your unlearning. Unlearn all the stuff that you felt kept you safe. Because now in me you have refuge. Can I mess you up a little bit? Jesus doesn't want to just give you a modification. He wants to give you a metamorphosis. Caterpillar to butterfly. But a butterfly has to unlearn the comforts of crawling. God, I hope y'all are getting this. So good, y'all. A caterpillar has to unlearn the comforts of crawling if he ever wants to experience the joy of flying. Crawling, for however long caterpillars crawl, once you get wings, you're going to have to unlearn what it was like to crawl to get around and embrace the wind. Jesus is saying, you, you, you must be born again. The wind goes wherever it chooses. Right now, even in this moment, the wind, the spirit of God, the wind is blowing, touching this person's heart and that person's heart and somebody else's heart. And I can't control it. I'm just a mere man and I can't see what it's doing. But the spirit is like the wind. It's just maneuvering all online in digital airspace and all in the sanctuary. The spirit of God is tugging at hearts and he's tugging at minds. You need to be born again. And we are in a dangerous place when we don't hear sermons and pulpits about being born again anymore. We hear more about your season. 2022 is your year, and God is going to give you this this year. And this preacher is telling you, sweaty this afternoon, you must be born again. Point number one, what God is looking for, ambassadors to arise. I believe this with my whole heart, y'all. Ambassadors to arise. An ambassador is an accredited official from another kingdom. I need those who will represent me in the earth and let the earth know I don't follow your rules, your customs. I come from the kingdom of heaven. I'm born again. So what's trendy and what's popular in culture, I don't adapt that because I'm not even of this world. God is looking for his ambassadors to arise. Point number two is a little harder. Jesus is looking for those who are willing to embrace the side effects. You may not know this, but following Jesus comes with side effects. Everybody praying for favor, I hope you're ready for hate. <laughs> comes with side effects, and this is why Nicodemus was treating Jesus like a side piece. I don't want the side effects from the Sanhedrin. I don't want the side effects of what everybody will think about me. Y'all remember last February, for those who were in Houston, it got real, real like cold and it snowed for a while, and we lost power when some pipes burst. Uh, blame my daughter, because she prayed for it. <laughs> she was like, Daddy, I want it to snow. I want it to snow. I want to be like Elsa. I want to be able to snow, man. <laughs> so every night she was praying, God, I thank you that it'll snow. God, I thank you that it'll snow. Then Valentine's weekend. February of 2021, it snowed, and it got, like, real cold, like muy frio. It got real cold, and we lost power, and it got real cold again, and pipes were bursting. And then my daughter walked up, and she said, Daddy, I don't want the snow no more. 
I said, but you prayed for this. Can you handle the side effects of what you prayed for? Some of us, what you're praying for, it's not that you can't handle it. It's that you can't handle the side effects. So when they say all this mean stuff under that post, because God did put it in your heart to start a YouTube channel so that you can lift your voice because there is something that you have to say. You can't handle the comments in the comment section yet. I have to give you the grace and the power to ignore critics since they focused on me. Can you handle the side effects? He's looking for those who are willing to embrace the side effects. If the smoke downstairs is bothering you, the fire upstairs is going to engulf you. Last point, surrender the presentation. Forget about who people think you are. Or how you want them to think that you are with the Lord. Be real. I could only anoint the authentic self. And for us to be born again, which is a separation of old into new. Born again literally means born from above. For us to be born again, God, I surrender my life. And I accept you. So, Father God, thank you for just the opportunity of us coming in your house to hear your word. My personal prayer, God, for everybody who heard this word is please don't let it be a, a flash fire where it sets us on fire for Sunday and then after that, no more. But I pray maybe for the first time this year or in somebody's life as they leave here, they'll begin to seek you more. That the same thing Nicodemus felt, a desire to get to know who is this Jesus more. I pray that your people will feel that as well. And I also, God, stand in the gap and ask for repentance. Forgive us for treating you like a side piece. Treating you like rule number one is you're always number two. Forgive us, oh God, for living life and not being boldly and unashamed for you. My prayer is that you'll light our hearts on fire so that the world could forever watch us burn for your glory. As we leave, her, leave here, remind us that we are now entering our mission field. And keep us until we come together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.